All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, JavaScript news podcast, bringing you all the best news about JavaScript. <laughs> what am I even saying? So we're JavaScript news podcast. Uh, this is episode 75, and uh, I've got some JavaScript news and libraries for you. You know, <laughs> you know what? Let's just go with that. So let's jump right into the getting started section that will get you started with, well, everything you got to know about stuff. And the first article we got here today is JavaScript promise combinators, promise.all.race and .all settled. This is an updated version of an older article from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier on the promises combinator. Why am I so bad today? Let me try this again. So this is an updated article on the promise combinators, including the now released dot all settled um, combinator that basically explains all you have to know about the promise combinators, how they work and what exactly can you do with them in a very detailed way. So if you're still new and getting into promises and a bit confused about, you know, how this works, how exactly do you go about them, uh, then do check this one out. It will explain everything you got to know about them. Right. Next article we got here is how to build a Chrome extension with Vue.js. So this is a pretty nice tutorial uh, showing you first of all how to start building the Chrome extension uh, in general without you know adding any fancy frameworks on top, and then demonstrates how to use Vue.js uh, to make your extension slightly better. So in this case, the extension created is a replacer for the new page in Chrome that uh, displays you dead jokes using Vue.js. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is a pretty good tutorial. Next article we got here is how to turn a Gatsby, an existing Gatsby site into a theme. So we talked about Gatsby themes a couple of podcasts ago. So they released this new feature that allows you to essentially turn your existing website into a reusable theme that can be used by other people, right? And uh, this article walks you through doing exactly that and sharing it on NPM to allow other people to reuse what you've basically created. So if you're working with Gatsby or you were thinking of working with it and wanted to do a reusable bit that is going to be used internally in your, in your company or you wanted to do an open source one, then do check this one out. It basically explains everything you need to know about that and does a very good job of introducing the Gatsby theming. Next article we got here is implementing animations in react with react spring. This is a pretty nice tutorial to react spring. If you never used it, it's probably one of the easiest and uh, nicest, at least in my experience, animation libraries for react. It is super easy to use it. It produces some really fancy animations and you can do some really crazy stuff with it. But this is an introduction tutorial. So if you were looking to get into react animations, then you know, this is a pretty good starting point. So check this one out. Next article we got here is a sync generator functions in JavaScript. This is an introduction uh, to the for await off loop that is coming soon ish, I believe I don't think it's actually been shipped. So there's the async generators proposal. And it is I think like stage two or something is a good question. Let us check it out quickly. So is there what is the stage? Uh, come on, there's got to be a stage written somewhere. Stage, stage, oh, so it, okay, it's actually really stage three. I missed completely when it's moved to stage three. So it is coming to the browsers very soon. And it allows you to do the asynchronous iteration of well, asynchronous generators, right? So the whole idea is that you can actually iterate over something that returns asynchronous values, right? And you produce them by using asynchronous generator functions. The whole concept is a bit tricky to grasp, especially if you're not familiar with the generators concept, which I think is not that widely used in JavaScript, especially in the front end. But uh, if the idea of this sounds interesting to you, I would definitely say check it out. This is a pretty good write up that uh, briefly explains how does it work and how you can write your own asynchronous generator. And when you would want to use something like this as well. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty good write up. I'm also quite surprised to see that it's already in stage three. I somehow completely missed that point. <laughs> but there we go. Okay, next article we got here is ES proposal global this a pretty nice explainer to the global this proposal that's uh, recently moved, I believe to stage three as well, if I remember correctly, uh, my memory may be failing me and it might be just stage two. But nonetheless, it's moving quite rapidly because the proposal itself is super simple. And we needed global this for ages. Um, if you don't know the problem with global this is that 
uh, this in browser and this in Node.js and this in various contexts in browser actually can point to a different things. And sometimes you just want to have this global this that you can easily access. But um, so far, there's, you know, there's been this polyfill that is incredibly complicated to actually uh, write, you, you know, you would think it's, it's really simple, right? You just get this global this object, and that's it. But no, there's actually like 25 caveats of how you can actually do that properly. And uh, just having a nice global this that points to the global this all the time is a very welcome thing. So if that sounds interesting. Do check out the article it does a good job of explaining how it works and uh, also how to write that uh, tricky polyfill. Next thing we got here is use effect versus use layout effect in plain approachable language. A pretty nice write up on the difference between use effect and use layout effect in React hooks. So if you're getting started with React and you're just getting into hooks and you're confused what is the difference between those two, then this is a very good detailed write up that demonstrates exactly how they are different and uh, when do you use one and when do you use another. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you already understand the hooks, then uh, this is probably not going to bring anything new to the table. Okay, next thing we got here is remainder operator versus module operator with JavaScript code. So there's this um, one of the things in JavaScript, so the percent operator, right, which is in majority of languages, it's a module operator, right. And the problem is in JavaScript is actually not it's a remainder operator. And a lot of people don't know that and expect it to work as a module operator and get very surprised when it's actually behaves as a remainder operator. And this article explains the difference, first of all, the difference between the remainder and module operator. So if you're not, you know, up to snuff with the mathematics, this will get you up to speed quite quickly. And then it explains that well, JavaScript operator is actually um, remainder. And for example, Python is a module, and I think majority of other languages as well. Um, yeah, if you were confused by it, do check it out as a very good job of explaining the difference and showing how they exactly they work. Uh, and yes, don't make that mistake. I think I've made it myself uh, in the very beginning when I just started working with it. And it took me like a week to figure out why is it not behaving the same way that it did in, in you know, in Python. <laughs> That was a painful experience. Okay, continuing, we got five tips to help you avoid React hooks pitfalls. Uh, this is an article from Mr. Ken C. Dodds, who is a, you know, typically produces very high quality, very uh, easy to understand content with regards to React and hooks. So if you're just getting with uh, started with React hooks, then do check this one out. It does an amazing job of pointing out the common pitfalls that you will encounter when you're just getting started with the hooks. So if you want to evade them, if you want to be better at hooks, make sure to check this one out There's like a lot of good pointers, a lot of uh, caveats that you have to keep in mind, a lot of tips that you can apply to make it better, like using ESLint plugin that is actually amazing. So yes, if you are getting started with react hooks do make sure to check this one out. Okay, next thing we got here is handling and dispatching events with Node.js. This is essentially a tutorial for the events module in Node.js and event emitters in general, I guess. Uh, so if you are not familiar with the event emitter idea, and you are not familiar with the events module in Node.js, this is a pretty good tutorial. So do check it out. If you already know how event emitter works, and you know how to use it, and what are events, essentially, then there is nothing really new here. Right, next thing we got here is Vue.js 3 function oriented programming. This is a nice introduction to using the function based API in Vue.js uh, already today with the version two. So there is turns out I didn't know about that because you know, I'm not a huge view user, but um, there is a Vue.js plugin that allows you to use function API with a view 2.x. So you can actually just install it and start using the function API today. And this is exactly what the article talks about. So it talks about the shortcomings of the current API as described by the Vue.js authors, it talks about why the function API was necessary, and how you can start using it today using Vue function API plugin. So if you're using Vue.js, and you were wanted to jump into the function way of writing the components, do check this one out, it does a very good job of uh, essentially setting you up with everything you need to know about it. Right. And the last thing we got today in the getting started section is why is the modern web development so complicated A long yet hasty explanation part one. So this is a multi part article so far only part one has been published as far as I could tell. 
but it actually does a really good job of explaining why the modern web development is, well, complicated, right? So as the title says, it walks you through the whole sort of evolution of web and development workflow for it, starting from, you know, like, hey, so we can actually just create a simple HTML file and simple JavaScript file and start writing it, right? But because JavaScript is relatively old, before it had limitations like no modules, no constant, no promises or sync, no array includes. I'm not sure why the author here decided that array includes is a very important thing, but hey, you know, clunky syntax, missing uh, syntax for a lot of common primitives, uh, countless DOM operations were needlessly complex. This is like one of the reasons why jQuery was so popular. And uh, yeah, there's some pretty good write up here on the history uh, that shows, you know, okay, okay, so we switch to the modern syntax, it makes things a lot easier, but it doesn't run in a, all browsers. So we need some way of tackling that, which means that we need Babel, right, that transpiles the modern JavaScript into older JavaScript that works everywhere. And then you add other things to account for other points. And essentially, we become like more and more complex. So the next article will be focused on NPM and bundling, but I I actually haven't, I don't think it is released just yet. Yeah, so this was the latest one that was released in July 11, and I'm guessing the next one is coming soon-ish. So that sounds interesting. If you're curious about the modern web development and how we got there, do make sure to check this one out. It's actually pretty good. Uh, Donna, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for your donation as always highly appreciated. Right, uh, so we are getting into the articles and news section. We don't have that many of them today. The first one is the new blog post from uh, Dan's overreacted blog, uh, and it's titled, How Does the Development Mode Works? And I would add in the React specifically, because it is a React-focused blog, but uh, it's not just you know React, unique to React, let's put it this way. Uh, it talks about the development mode in the code, how it can be beneficial and how it works in the simplest instance, as in we know when you have this dev flag or if you're using the uh, environmental variables to publish something to production, how does it translate? How does it actually works with the whole, you know, pre-compiling and tree shaking and code elimination and stuff like this? So that uh, in actually from the complex conditions, you end up having just one function in the final build um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very straightforward process. And if you ever did something similar yourself, you probably know exactly how it works. But if you are just getting into the development uh, in JavaScript, and you never heard about this concept of splitting your code into development and production modes, then this is a very good starting point that will teach you about doing that and will tell you how exactly that works and what you can do to make it better. Because there are some caveats that you have to keep in mind, like, you know, using the variables won't quite work uh, as well as using the magic variables or environmental variables. There's also a bunch of other things to keep in mind here. So uh, if you are interested, do make sure to check this one out. It's a very good write up as usual. Right, next thing we got here is detecting incognito mode in Chrome 76 um, with a timing attack. So there's an interesting one. If you remember, we talked about the Chrome 76 releasing the new incognito mode that is closing a bunch of existing, uh, essentially bugs, right, that allow you to detect that the user is running in incognito mode, right? So of course, there's going to be people who will find other bugs and issues and attacks that allow you to still detect this incognito mode. And this is one of them. So it turns out the file system API in incognito mode behaves differently from the file system API in the non incognito mode, right? And the difference is in timings, which is, I, I, like, I still don't quite understand how the hell did author find this problem or, you know, this behavior, I guess not the problem. It is absolutely fascinating. So there's this chart of uh, timing distribution, right? Uh, depending on the uh, count and the right time in the milliseconds. So there's a very specific uh, timing for a very specific uh, count just in incognito mode. So if you can see, it's like, it is, I mean, yes, it writes in RAM, but like, how do you, this is just crazy. How do you discover something like this? I totally get that, you know, this is the whole like RAM versus the hard drive and uh, size limits and everything, but it is fascinating. And um, the downside of it is that uh, there's a snippet of code here that actually takes 
uh, very large strings, like 5,000 charters long, and uh, proceeds to write them into the um, file system. And I, I imagine, you know, just like looking at this code, it just feels painful. Just imagine using this code to detect incognito mode and just like hammering the file system from the browser. And then the people wonder why the website is slow. So next time you go to someone's website and they basically feel slow on the first load, then maybe they are trying to detect if you're running in incognito mode by writing about six megabytes of garbage into your file system, which is just absolutely insane. But hey, it works, you know, and um, I know that the, you know, the guys who like do the New York Times or whatever have this like limited uh, number of articles that you can actually access. They do a lot of this incognito mode detection to prevent people from reading more articles, which is absolutely silly. And you can just, you know, do against by opening the inspect, go into the application tab and clicking the clear site data, and then you can read more, right? But I guess it works, you know, for majority of people who are not aware of that. But, you know, the fact that it has to write so much garbage in the file system to find out that you're in incognito mode is a bit scary, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating write-up. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's a really cool one. Uh, again, very interesting attic surface and will be interesting to see how the Chrome team addresses that. Um, I didn't know that, but then again, if there's a paywall, I'm not staying. Yeah, that's also fair enough. I typically also close those uh, websites quite quickly, but you know, there are people who want to work around them. And the most annoying point is that even if there is a paywall and you go there and you know you're going to close it if there's a paywall. This code is still going to be executed, right? And your file system is still going to be hammered with like megabytes of garbage just to know if you're running incognito or node, which is, oh boy, not, not a fan of that basically. But okay, continuing the next article we got here is top four tactics to keep Node.js rocking in Docker. So this is an official uh, post for, I guess, this is a post from the official Docker blog from the uh, one of the members of the Docker team that talks about running Node.js apps in a Docker and uh, gives a few very good points uh, to keeping it better. Uh, so if you're working with Node.js and Docker, then make sure to check this out because there's some really good pointers like, for example, did you know there is Node Slim image, which is just double the size of Node Alpine, which is the Alpine is the tiniest uh, image size you can get, which is like 75 megs. Node Slim is just double the size, 150 megs, but it gives you all the benefits of the normal Node image without all the downsides of the Alpine, which can be extremely quirky to work with, especially if you have like native dependencies. Has a bunch of other things like, you know, how to deal with the Node modules, caching and all that kind of stuff and uh, tips like yeah don't use process managers and start the your app directly with a node instead of running npm to evade the um what was it called the uh god damn it i'm forgetting the name of this thing wait a second zero uh oh, pid one yeah pid one problem so there's there's some issues with docker when your process is not pid one and doing npm start can sometimes lead to that which is why it's recommended to do the node and then calling the uh, script directly. But yes, basically if you're running node in Docker and you want to learn a bit more about it, I would highly recommend reading through this article. It's quite good. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is investigating Discord's React memory leak. So this is an interesting one. Um, uh, if you if, if you never heard about Discord, we do have a Discord server, by the way, so do feel free to join, shame this blog here. Uh, Discord is a sort of chat application, right? And their desktop app is Electron written in React and their web service is just React uh, front end, which actually works surprisingly well without a desktop at all. So, I mean, the only benefit of installing desktop Discord is really uh, having the global um, hotkey, but you know, now here's the thing. So they had the version running on React version 16.5 and everything was perfectly well. And then they decided to upgrade to 16.7 and the memory started leaking. The same went for 16.8, but they really wanted to have it because of the hooks, right? Because the engineers wanted to migrate to hooks and uh, they went down to track it. Now here's the interesting thing. They didn't actually, uh, so they, they did track the memory leak and it's 
basically came down to the React Fiber uh, nodes and detached DOM elements and the garbage collection or them not being garbage collected actually. So the solution from the Discord side was to fork the React and tweak the React Fiber implementation to actually free those nodes in a better way essentially, right? So they did that, they shipped it, and it turned out that there wasn't enough. So they had to track it down again. And this time around it was related to time boxing that the, you know, the, uh, the technique of allocating the fixed amount of time for a specific activity and then disposing of it if it didn't finish in time to make everything feel snappy, which is a pretty good uh, thing, but there are some problems to it. So again, they revised the React fork, they again patched it to clear this DOM to fiber references on unmounts even better essentially and it seems like this fixed the memory leak but they didn't so what's interesting for me is that they decided that the forking react was a better way than actually tracking down the original issue why this caused it right because there is there is so they are not the only one having this memory leaking problem with the react and there's actually an umbrella memory leaks issue on the react repo because a lot of people are having this problem but um, the problem is none of them can provide a reproducible localized issue that displays that this is indeed a problem with React, which is quite interesting to me. So I'll be curious to see why exactly this happens because it doesn't feel like this is a React issue, uh, right? It feels like there's some components use React in a way that is just not clear enough and something doesn't get garbage collected along the way which is why they have to force this garbage collection in a fiber to actually make it work correctly. And this is exactly, at least, you know, in my head, I feel like this is the reason they couldn't pr provide their simple repro case because it's not that simple and it's actually related to the way they build the components. But uh, nonetheless, it's a fascinating write-up and it's actually very interesting to see that the, for a large company like Discord, it is easier to keep their own fork of React that addresses this memory leak in a sort of internal way, rather than to track down this memory leak in a correct way, let's put it this way, and uh, figure out why it happens, right? So it's, it's a very fascinating uh, behavior in my opinion. Um, I guess it works as a stopgap measure until the actual root issue gets fixed. Um, I mean, here's like the thing is they're not, so the article says they decided to no longer look for the root issue because their hack essentially of the fiber solves it. And uh, they're basically hoping the React team will find the cause and fix it. But I, you know, from the discussion in that GitHub issue, there's like a lot of comments I was removed, but it seems like people just created repro case and it was like, oh, garbage collection actually collects everything. So I was like, okay, that means it's not an issue, right? It's not leaking memory if garbage collector is kicking in correctly. So it's, it's a tricky problem. And I will be curious to see where that goes and um, how in the end the Discord team will solve it. I really hope they will do another write up on that. But uh, yes, it is, it is quite interesting, absolutely. Okay, continuing, we got meta programming in JavaScript with JS code shift. So this is um, introduction to metaprogramming and code mods. Uh, if you never heard about them, the idea is that you have a, some sort of a tool that works with your codes using it as data, right? So this is the whole idea behind metaprogramming. And this introduces you to a bunch of tools that you can use to do metaprogramming with JavaScript, like JS Code Shift, Recast, Esprima, and stuff like this. Uh, and what you can exactly do with that, right? So like how does the ST works and how does the code mod works? Uh, if you never heard about code modes, then the uh, Facebook, the team behind the React and Jest and so on and so forth, they are big fans of uh, code modes and they provide quite a lot of tooling that works uh, with the code modifications and allows you to migrate, for example, from you know the older versions of React to newer versions of React uh, without manually rewriting some of the parts of your code, which is uh, super handy. So yeah, if you are, yeah, so there's like another example is this Gatsby migrations they actually provided code mode for some parts, but uh, apparently it's hard. So it doesn't actually work all the time. <laughs> but uh, yes, if that does sound interesting, if you're interested in metaprogramming, or maybe you are, uh, you know, wanted to get an intro to the concepts, do check this article out. It's actually quite good. Banging your head on the wall is a common developer pastime. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> 
But this is kind of your job, right? To solve the problems and uh, figure out what the hell is wrong. So I find this to be the typical state. <laughs> All right, uh, but continue. I think this is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and besides awesomeness. The first thing we got here today is the new version of the React Native website. So we got absolutely redesigned, refreshed website that has quite a bit of uh, better communication of what is React Native and how to use it. And there's like the docs for now, I think are old ones, but they already have the umbrella issue that would be uh, introduce the documentation rework. Uh, what I found found cool is that I don't think that was here before. They've actually added the um, API examples and API Explorer that immediately shows you how the native components look using the Expo embeds, which is really cool. And you can also look how it looks on a web version, but if you have a device on your hand, you can actually um, Either play it with a web version. Oh, that's okay. I didn't even have to wait. That's interesting. Uh, so yeah, you can look how it looks on a specific device, Android or iOS, or you can even run it on your device if you have the Expo app installed, which is uh, pretty cool. So yeah, that's quite exciting. Next thing we got here is the announcement from Microsoft Edge team, which is the uh, fresh addition to the Edge Dev and Canary builds. Uh, they've added the 3D DOM viewer. So if you ever used Firefox DevTools, you know that this was there. And I always wondered why the Chrome team never added this to it. Well, there you go. Now you can have a Chrome with a 3D uh, DOM navigator um, integrated and it's brought to you by Microsoft. This looks really awesome and um, you can get it and try it right now. It is behind the flag for now. So you have to enable it, uh, but yeah, this is this is really awesome. Like I've, this is one of the features that I really liked in Firefox and always regretted that it wasn't actually available in Chrome. But again, I am quite excited to see the uh, final, you know, stable edge release because I feel like I'm gonna switch you to using it once it is there with all the features like sync and everything. Um, because yeah, it looks quite damn exciting. Okay, next thing we got here is the native lazy loading just landed in Chrome 76. So you can now actually use a bunch of um, lazy loading for images and iframes. Now, on one hand, this is really awesome. So you no longer have to manually use something like intersection observer or whatever to detect if the image is in, you know, in the view to actually start loading it. The Chrome does it for you. The problem is it is just in the Chrome right now. So if you're, you know, if you want to use it in all the other browsers, you would still need a polyfill or something like this to work with it. And I believe it is not exactly standard right now. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping this is going to end up being a standard and we're going to see it in all the other browsers as well, because this feature is very well needed. But yeah, uh, nonetheless, if you want to try it out and you use Chrome, you can do it today and it seems to be working quite nicely. Okay, next thing we got here is announcing the WebHint browser extension. So the WebHint is that um, sort of service, I guess, or set of tools that is allowing you to lint your website. So it's sort of like the... Um, Lighthouse audits from the Chrome, but that does a whole lot more, right? And before that, they were available as a web service or as a command line tool. But now you can actually have an extension that lives in your dev tools and allows you to get this very nice audit that tells you what you can improve with regards to accessibility, compatibility, performance, pitfalls, progressive web apps, and security. So if you're working on the apps and you care about the quality, Make sure to check this one out. It seems to be quite nice, um, quite nicely integrated into Chrome. And uh, yes, it works. I mean, there's obviously some overlap with the Lighthouse, uh, but it does have quite a bit more features than the Lighthouse in some other aspects. So I would suggest to run both of them. All right, and the last thing we got here is the JS 13K Games, eighth annual JS 13K Games Challenge. That is uh, basically going to be uh, starting quite soon. Yes, August 13 is the kickoff and then it's going to be going. Uh, when does it end? It's like two weeks or something or whatever. Da -da um, doesn't seem like they actually announced the end of it, but whatever. So if you are interested in building games in JavaScript in just 
13 kilobytes, then do check it out. Uh, one month, 12 sept 13 September. Okay, cool. Uh, for whatever reason, it's not written here, but great. Okay, so it's one month to write a 13 kilobyte game in JavaScript and make it as awesome as always. Um, I personally can never do something like this. I like it's just terrifying to me, but I love while looking at the result of the competition and the examples they give there is always mind blowing what you could do in just 13 kilobytes. It's on a website. Oh, okay. I get, I mean, they could have mentioned this in the article. Yeah, okay, 30 in September. Yeah, that, well, anyway, it's a really cool competition. If you wanna take part, make sure to, you know, start preparing. August 13 is nearly here. And we'll be curious to see what the people published this time around. I will definitely cover the results once the competition is closed on the September 13. So yeah, pretty exciting. All right, this is it for the tips and tricks and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we come into the releases section. The first release uh, of the week is a Node.js version 12.8. There is not that many major things here. I mean, the most noteworthy, I guess, is the V8 get, get hip. Uh, blah. Let me try that again get heap code statistics that is now exposed from the V8 so you can actually access it from uh, JavaScript. Um, other stuff is, yeah, pretty minor, but uh, you know, if you're living on edge, make sure to update. There is always uh, quite a bunch of uh, fixes as usual. Uh, next update we got here is the July update of VS Code version 1.37. Uh, coming in with a full product icon refresh. Uh, the, I don't really like new icons, to be honest, but you know, whatever, that's not a major thing. The cool bits is uh, they've added the find and replace preserve case. So you can actually search for a string and replace it. And the replacement will actually preserve the case that the replace string was with, which is uh, actually very handy. So um, other stuff is, yeah, it's like, there's some UX improvements to terminal search. There is the revealed search results in the search bar, search regex improvements. And it now shows the NPM script feature that I didn't even know existed. So I guess it's a good thing that it shows it by default because I imagine a lot of people didn't know it existed as well. <laughs> um, there we go. All right, next release we got here is the React version 16.9 and the roadmap update. So they are renaming the methods. Uh, component will mount, will receive props and will update to unsafe underscore method name. The old method name will still function, but you will get the deprecation warnings. Uh, the idea is that basically you have to migrate from them and find a better approaches uh, there. They have the docs that suggest them basically. So make sure to read that uh, because in the React 17, they will be removed and uh, yes, uh, basically keep that in mind. They're also deprecating JavaScript and URLs because it's a common edX surface. And they're also deprecating factory components because they are confusing since they look kind of like uh, function components, but they are not. Um, Cool new features. They've added the asynchronous act for testing. So you can actually, when you test hooks, you can use a sync function internally and then await for the act itself once it finishes. That was, that was one of the most annoying things that I had to deal with when testing hooks. And now it's basically a lot easier. I've also uh, added the react.profiler thing and you can now do performance measurements in your app uh, whenever you desire. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So there's a update to the roadmap. If you remember, they've uh, shared that there's gonna be shipping suspense for data and concurrent mode sometime mid 2019, that never happened. So they've actually opted to delaying those both releases and shipping them as a one major version. I guess it's gonna be React 17 and they are planning to ship it before end of the year. So this is, uh, you know, all very exciting and I cannot wait to see what the uh what what how does the data fetching in suspense mode will actually look because i'm i kind of thinking it's going to be as awesome as the hooks release but okay there we go um the next release we got here is outstated version 3.0 which adds the automatic different context splitting for the uh, storage so if you never heard outstated is a tiny library that i built um, for state management in React, the idea is that it works in a very similar way to the unstated, but it actually uses hooks. 
Uh, so you wrap everything with a provider, you give it your store that uses hooks to set state, and then you can use that store anywhere you want, which will make it a shared, st shared state. And you can do stuff, right? So when I initially wrote it, the version one and two, they use the same context for all the stores, which meant as soon as you update one of the stores, it will trigger re-renders in all of the tree, which is not that good, right? So one of the users, um, Alexandrius, username Alexandrius, th huge thanks to him. He, uh, he came up with a way to actually automatically split the stores into different contexts so that when one store updates, only the components that actually use that store will trigger re-render and all the other ones will not. So yeah, it's, it's actually really cool. I mean, there is unstated next, um, which also has hooks. But the downside of unstated next is that actually you have to create and manage those uh, providers yourself. So the difference between outstated is that outstated actually does it now for you automatically. Um, the downside is obviously that it actually wraps those. Uh, so it's going to nest the context and the more stores you have, the more context are going to be nested. But I think it's a minor downside, especially, you know, since you normally don't have more than a couple of stores. Uh, to pay for the convenience, basically. So yes, I am pretty happy how the version 3 came out, so do check it out. Next release we've got here is the Commander JS version 3, a major release for the command line uh, interface framework uh, that is relatively popular, I think, that adds quite a ton of things. So if you're using it, make sure to check it out. There is some breaking changes, so keep that in mind if you're going to be updating. All right, that is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section. The first library we got here is translingual, multilingual transliteration, phonetic transliteration for uh, using transcription. So I, I honestly don't know why would you use that, but um, I guess there are some use cases. I mean, this exists, right? So it actually allows you to tr transliterate from one language to another language phonetically, which um, actually looks quite good. So, you know, looking at the examples from English to Russian, that is actually pretty cool. I, yeah, it supports a bunch of languages. I, yeah, again, I, I honestly don't know what the use case is, but if you do know what the use case for something like this is, and if you wanted to transliterate stuff phonetically from one language to another, do check it out. It actually looks pretty good. Next library we got here, or actually um, boilerplate, it's a hackathon starter, a boilerplate for Node.js web apps. This sort of aims to be all in one hackathon starter that has, well, everything you might want to need for hackathon, including uh, OAuth 1 and 2, flash notifications, MVC project structure, SAS, bootstrap with themes, contact form, account management, Gravatar, password management, reset, change, forgot password, whatever, account deletion, CSRF. API examples for Foursquare, Facebook. So basically you can just, you know, take this as a boilerplate, then remove unneeded parts and you can essentially have an app that is already working, which I can see how can it, how it can be handy for a hackathon. So yes, if you are doing a lot of hackathons, I guess check this one out. Next thing we got here is MCJS, open source Minecraft clone built using 3JS, ReactJS, GraphQL and Node.js. I'm still not sure why the hell does need GraphQL, but there we go. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a Minecraft clone written in, in JavaScript and it actually works relatively well. I don't remember if they had any demo, but uh, yes, you can run it locally pretty easily. And uh, it's a Minecraft engine essentially, and you can extend it in any way you want and it works in your browser. So if you're curious how to make something like this, or you just want to play around with it, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Mind Elixir Core, a free open source mind map core. So there's this um, demo or you know public website that you can just use. It actually seems pretty nice. So you can you know you can uh, there's like a focus mode where you can do things like this, and it seems pretty great. I am not a huge fan of uh, mind maps. I never found them useful, but if you are thinking in these ways and if you, you know, you use a lot of them, do check this one out. It's yeah, again, it's open source, it's free and it's MIT licensed if I remember correctly. So do check it out. This looks quite nice. Next thing we got here is React JS video B B G. Video Bege. I'm not sure how to read that. So it's a uh, video backgrounds for React apps. 
basically allows you to make a background for your website a video in a very simple tag way yeah looks like this works quite nicely very simple to use and doesn't seem to be that large just 2.4 kilobytes min zipped so if you're looking for something like this do check it out Next thing we got here is intrusive, minimal uh, in indeterminate loading bar for websites. So uh, the demo I think displays more than anything is sort of this uh, very subtle indeterminate loading bar on the top. I think it's very similar to what you see on like YouTube, but YouTube has them sort of determined. Uh, this one is indeterminate and you can customize it with, um, with colors. Uh, there's too many zeros, one, two, one, two, one, two stop start and there you go and that doesn't does it actually oh change color there we go now it works okay yeah so it's you know it's a very simple very small very easy to use so if you were looking at something like this do check it out next thing we got here is node ppt this is probably the best web presentation tool so far it's a very amusing way to describe it but yes this is a web presentation tool so the web uh, presentation framework essentially um, amusingly enough, the repo seems to be in Chinese, if I understand correctly, and the readme and documentation is in Chinese, but if you go into the website, the docs here that are in the presentation format are actually in English, and it does seem to be pretty cool. So if you're working a lot with the presentations, and if you are looking for something very fancy with a lot of features, then do check this one out. There's like a lot of pretty nice uh, features that it has. And, you know, okay, maybe reading docs in the presentation form is not the best, but you can send a pull request to the um, readme file to make it translated properly. Because again, this is exactly the same docs that are in readme, but in a presentation format. So yeah, if you are interested, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Cashify, lightweight currency conversion library successor of MoneyJS. So if you want to convert currency, then this is uh, seems like an okay way of doing it. Now, what I don't personally like is this way of working with currencies with fractions. One thing I've learned is that whenever you work with currencies, you never use fractions ever. And yeah, it seems like, you know, if you're not that bothered about the precision, this is probably going to be okay. But if you really work with money, then maybe you don't want to work with fractions here. But uh, yeah, then again, maybe this is the library that you were looking for. So there we go. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is Electron extensions. Uh, this is a very interesting one. Implementations of Chrome extensions API for Electron. This effectively allows you to plug it into your Electron app and use Chrome extensions in it, like literally load them from file system and they will work as is within your Electron app, which is quite interesting to be honest. I'm very curious to see how that will fare in the real world project and uh, what exactly the APIs that are implemented, but it looks very interesting. So, you know, if you were working with Electron apps and you wanted to use existing Chrome extensions in them, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Data Vader, a library for object validation. So yet another object validator that, um, I mean, looks quite nice. So yeah, it's like you got declarative um, validation schema uh, that you can define declaratively or by passing in options and then you can validate different things. Looks okay. I mean, you know, there's joy. So I personally don't think I ever needed anything more than joy, but maybe you do. Maybe this is something that you will like. Next thing we got here is React Transitions. Uh, this is, yeah, essentially a project that gathers like a bunch of transitions that you can do with React and it's a CSS transition. So all you have to do is literally just add CSS classes and it will work. Um, you know, if you just need transitions, then this might be a good idea. If you need some more complex animations, again, I would suggest going for something like React Spring, but uh, nonetheless, it's a really nice example uh, and if you want to learn how CSS transitions are done, I guess this is a very good starting point. Right, continuing, we got Kogo Toast, a beautiful zero configuration toast messages for React. This is, yeah, literally toast messages that look like this. They are quite nice and uh, relatively small. I personally am not a fan of toast messages because I find them to be 
well, at least, you know, they can be confusing because you can click like on a thing on the bottom of the screen and then expect something to happen in there. But then there's a toast message that shows up in a completely different space in the screen. And you might just not notice, at least this is what tends to happen with me. Maybe I'm just blind, but yeah, I prefer to notify the user in place that usually works better in my experience, but um, it can be useful in some cases. So there you go. Next thing we got here is use a wolf. The simplest way to add authentication to your React app. So this is actually the uh, Auth0 authentication and it's sort of hook that adds authentication through Auth0 to all your app in a very simple way. Like it is very, very simple. And if you're using Auth0, there's probably, it might be the easiest way I've seen to add it actually. So this, it shows you how to use it with Gatsby here. And it literally is just use a with hook for um, getting the authenticated state and user info. And then you just wrap everything into the OAuth provider and you're done. It is extremely simple. So if you're using OAuth0, do check it out. It might be quite nice for you. Next thing we got here is the use subscription hook. This is actually um, an official hook, or I guess, I guess you could say it's an official hook because it's published by the React team themselves. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't have a repo link. So I imagine it's somewhere in the React core maybe. Um, but it is a hook that allows you to safely manage subscription in concurrent mode. And uh, there are some examples essentially. So if you work with any subscriptions that um, do something like observables or callbacks or events or whatever, it might be a bit tricky to manage them in a safe way within React. And this hooks aims to essentially simplify that by uh, providing the use subscription abstraction that basically will clean everything up for you, right? So you essentially use memo to create this object that has the get current value and subscribe methods. And then you pass it to use subscription to uh, essentially allow the hook to manage it for you, right? Seems quite straightforward. I guess it just includes all the best practices for managing the subscriptions instead of doing it yourself. Um, again, I'm curious why is it not, does not include the repo here or if it's a part of the core React, why is it not actually exposed within the React itself? Maybe just as a test thing, it's gonna be there later on. But uh, yeah, it seems quite handy. So if you're working with subscriptions in React, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React Archer draw arrows between DOM elements in React. So it actually allows you to connect DOM elements using arrows. I, I mean, it looks pretty fancy. I'm not sure what the use case will be again, but uh, yes, you can do that. And yes, you can actually connect stuff with arrows and you can label them and it is literally DOM elements. Uh, so if you know the use case, do check it out. This looks quite nice, actually. Next thing we got here is React Flippy, flipping cards for your React projects. Literally what it says is just flip cards that you can uh, use as basically two divs to display something, either flipped on hover or flipped on other event that you want. Seems very straightforward to use. So maybe you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is just gauge, a handy JavaScript plugin for generating and animating nice and clean dashboard gorges. So uh, yeah, it's just, you know, gorges with uh, percentages or whatever you want. Uh, seems very straightforward to use uh, just some basic JavaScript in here, nothing super fancy, a lot of properties that you can modify and a demo if you wanna see it, a very fancy one. So uh, yeah, if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. And the last thing we got here is Resemble.js, a very fancy looking image analysis and comparison library and that allows you to compare images right in the browser in a very fancy manner. There was, um, there was a demo somewhere. Where the hell is the link? Uh, there we go. So there is this uh, example images, right? And it actually allows you to ignore a bunch of things if you want, like ignore less, ignore scholars, ignore anti-aliasing, ignore alpha, scale images to same size, uh, display the difference. Okay, in this case, it's like displaying pink and yellow. This is not too much different. 
There is also stuff like, okay, you can actually make it transparent. You can set bounding box, so it will only detect the difference in specific boundaries. You can set ignore boxes, so it will ignore specific area of um, image. And then there is stuff like you can actually use images with alpha. In this case, you know, everything is different, but then you can ignore alpha, so it will actually detect only the alpha difference, which is kind of great. So, so yes, if you're working with images, do check it out. It seems to be pretty nifty. Okay, and uh, this is it for libraries and demos. The last thing I want to highlight today is the announcement from the GitHub. So the GitHub actions that they've announced last year, I believe, and they are still in you know private access. They've just announced that the GitHub actions now support CI and CD from GitHub free for public repos and there's like 2000 minutes for private repos. And uh, yeah, it just basically, we basically now have CI CD in GitHub natively without any other third party stuff. So GitHub, I guess in this case, they're catching up to the GitLab functionality. Um, the cool part is that, first of all, as I said, you already get uh, 2000 minutes for private repos for free. But you can also, the same manner that you can do it in a GitLab, you can set up your own private runners that will do uh, basically work um, infinitely, right? So it's like if you have a private runner, you can self-host it and run the CI CD for free essentially, right? Which is quite interesting. So it seems like, in this case, it really seems like GitHub is just playing catch up with a GitLab because GitLab has been providing a feature like this for years now, basically. But uh, nonetheless, it's pretty neat. It's a bit sad that it's still like GitHub Actions are limited and not GA, but um, they are going to be generally available on November 13th. This is the release date. And I imagine there's going to be like public beta or whatever uh, in the next months. And yes, it's definitely better later than never. Uh, but yeah, there you go. Okay, that is it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly, episode 75. As usual, you can find all the links on the GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Um, if you have anything that I might have missed or you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Meanwhile, we have, as I said, you know, bxjs.dev is the website that lists all the resources that are available. Um, we have Discord server that you can join and chat with us about JavaScript or video games. Um, there is, uh, yeah, social stuff like Twitter, Facebook, whatever. I haven't updated Facebook in ages, but it exists for some reason still. Um, uh, Front and Nexus, thank you very much for your Twitch subscription. Highly appreciate it. Uh, your support is always more than welcome. And uh, yeah, I guess this is actually it from my side. So if you guys don't have anything else to talk about, we can uh, very much wrap this up and go have a um, great weekend or, um, you know, do something else more unproductive, I guess. Right. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't actually think I have anything else to talk about. We're closing in on episode 100, which is terrifying to me, but uh, that's the thing. Right. Doesn't seem like there's any more questions or suggestions. So... Thank you guys very much for watching. Once again, thank you very much for your continued support to everyone who back me and donate and subscribe. And, you know, I wouldn't be here without you. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or awesome rest of the week if you're watching the VOD of this. And I see you next week. Bye.